from the uh, point of view of physics. And I'll stand back so you can see the screen. Uh, first, we're going to talk about it, interaction of charged particles with matter. Uh, that has to do with the way the particles are going to interact with the, uh, the cells and, the, and various things. And we'll talk about the interaction with electric and magnetic fields. And of course, these two things are sort of mixed up with each other. So the first thing we have is that when ions go through matter, they collide with electrons in the, in the target material. Uh, they create vacancies, and they, uh, uh, which can directly ba break chemical bonds. Uh, the other effect is that the ion, as it is doing that damage to the material, it's losing energy and also will change its direction. The, uh, there are also the recoiling electrons can also be, then become ions which do their own damage. So there's the, the, uh, the ion that's coming in does damage directly, but it knocks out electrons which have energy and then also cause ionization uh, somewhere away from the, the immediate path of the uh, particles. And uh, when the electrons stop, you can get free radicals uh, or, or uh, active species at the location of the track end of the electron. Just a picture of a positive charge with electric fields going outward. Uh, and if you have a negative charge, these outward fields bend around to the negative charge and the two charges then are attracted to each other. And if you have, a, um, in, a, in a helium ion, well, this is a, an example of, a, of a, an atom, you have positive charges in the center and electrons that are around the outside in, in a cloud. And the positive charges in the middle here with a helium ion, you have two protons and two neutrons and the uh, cloud of electrons, and what I'm notation here is on how big these things are. Now human beings were on the order of meters in size. Human cells are uh, about 10 to the minus 5 times that. 10 microns in diameter is the size of a cell in the human body. And if you go down another 10 to the minus 5 from there, you get the size of the atom. And if you go down another 10 to the minus 5, you get the size of the nucleus. So they're huge dimensional differences of these various things. Humans to cells to atoms to nuclei each uh, 10 to the fifth difference. So when a, an ion goes by an atom, what it does, this attracts the electrons and pulls them out. See what you end up with is the electrons get removed from the uh, uh, region of the nucleus. Uh, it leaves a vacancy and so you have a net positive charge on this after the electrons have been removed by the uh, uh, atom ion collision. Track of a proton in water, now these are actually uh, pictures taken with a, a pr projection chamber and so this is what a uh, when a 5 MeV proton goes through it collides with uh, atoms of water along this line is actually water vapor and here's where a secondary electron has gone off, and here's where it's stopped. There's a little bunch of ionization at the end. Uh, this is another track where you don't have a, any of these longer range particles, but the, you have ionization along the track. And so you have something with a diameter of, a, of a 90 nanometers or so uh, around the, uh, the actual trace of the uh, proton. One concept you need to know in uh, interaction of ions with matter is what's called linear energy transfer, the LET. It's one of the standard measures we use for, uh, to describe uh, radioactive par or ions traveling through ma material. As a particle goes through a piece of material, you have some thickness of it. There's a certain amount of energy that gets lost in that thickness. And the ratio of that uh, energy lost per thickness is the LET. And uh, for convenience, we use the uh, units for LET of KeV per micron. So that's the kilo electron volts of energy loss per micron of material. So if you have a, an alpha particle, the number here will be somewhere in the order of 90 to uh, 150 or the sort of numbers you see for alpha particles. And uh, 
the cell being a, a few microns thick, it gives you an idea that you might lose an MeV of energy in, in one cell. This is, a, this is a program you might want to download. It's free. It's called SRIM, and it's useful for calculating the energy loss of particles going through material. And what I have here is a, an alpha particle coming in from the left. The model of material here is a skeletal muscle. The program gives you a chance you can put in metals or silicon, you know, all, any, uh, uh, any elemental composition of the sample. And this particular one is one that is a model for, for, uh, for muscle tissue. And what you have here is the depth in the tissue. And uh, this is 50 microns at the end of the scale. So for this particle, uh, it stops here at about 38 microns. This shows the way the LET changes with depth in tissue, starting with your 5 MeV particle here. This is called the Bragg curve. So we, what you think of is a lower LET at the entrance, it goes up and then stops this way. Uh, the units in this case are MeV per, or EV per angstrom is the, the units they use, but it translates directly. If you multiply this number by 10, you get the KeV per micron. And so for alpha particles, stopping is something like 240 kV per micron at the end of range. Now we do the same thing uh, with, with protons. Protons have a lower LET, so they have a longer range. And the, the uh, height of the LET curve, you see the, the difference here. Alpha particles come to a screeching halt here in the middle uh, with a 240 kV per micron. And here are the uh, protons, and they, you can't read this, but it's about um, uh, just over 100 kV per micron at the stop. And the, at the low end here, it's 10 kV per micron. And the uh, entrance here, it's, it's more like uh, uh, 80 kV per micron. So the difference here, alpha particles give up their energy a lot faster, so they're much more damaging. And there are two ways this is more damaging. One is that more energy has been left. But because the energy is being left in a more concentrated way, there's this another factor that the damage is more complex. Uh, it'll, the alpha particle will, can damage DNA a couple of times as it goes by. You know, one particle can do much more damage. Uh, so it's the LET is the important parameter that you'll you'll see when you're anybody studying uh, uh, ions in matter. Uh, and I ask what the consequences are. This is a, a chemical diagram of, of a DNA molecule. One of the possible things you can do is uh, damage the backbone. These, these strands on the outside which hold it all together. This is where you get a, a strand break. So if you break one of these, it's a single strand break. And the, this, that has to be repaired. Or if you manage to break both sides, you have a double strand break and the, and the DNA can actually separate and get married up to another uh, chromosome somewhere else. Uh, you can have indirect damage where the, the particle goes somewhere over here, but there are radicals that are formed in the water, and those can go in and you can have chemical reactions with the radicals with the DNA. And uh, it's possible to have damage on the inside, these are very weak bonds in a, in a DNA strand. They're called hydrogen bonds. And it, even though there, there's so many of them that the strands hold together solidly, the, when the DNA is being replicated, it's something that can be opened up and, uh, and for the replication of DNA. But there's certain types of damage in this region where instead of having hydrogen bonds, you actually end up with an ionic bond between the two strands. It's called a crosslink. And it m makes it and if it isn't repaired, it makes it so that the strands can't be duplicated. And so you may end up damaging the, the uh, DNA in such a way that the cell can't go through another stage of replication because you've, you've stitched it together in a way that the, uh, that the uh, replication mechanism can't do. So crosslinks is another kind of damage. You're more likely to hear people talk about breaks because that's what you see in, when you're doing mutations or chromosome studies. So you're looking at... Uh, strand breaks, but crosslinks are also important. And uh, 
this last line has to do with what I was saying that an alpha particle, a stopping alpha particle, can produce a tremendous amount of damage very locally. And so what you can have is heavy damage in a small volume. So maybe instead of having one single strand break here, you might end up with the five single strand breaks, a double strand break, and a couple of cross links, all in a relatively small volume. And then what that gives you is something that is probably not repairable and the cell is going to die sooner or later. Now, on the accelerator side, that was the biological implications. For the energy loss, when you're looking at an accelerator, <coughs> your beam transfer cord ha has to be evacuated. You have to have very low pressure inside so that the particles can get from the source the accelerator and down the beam transport to your, the end of your uh, of your system. You need a thin exit window. It's, as the particle goes through material it changes angle. And so if you want to have a micro beam, di you know, micron diameter spot, you have to have a window that's thin enough that the particles aren't deflected. So there are some nice uh, windows you'll find most people are using a, a material called silicon nitride. It can be made uh, 100 nanometers thick in small areas, and so you can, it provo provides a good vacuum seal, but uh, virtually no scattering. You need a close spacing between the window and the sample, and this is if related to the same factor. If you come through a window and go off at an angle, but your target is right there on top of it, it doesn't make any difference. Because your spacing, even though there's an angle, it doesn't give you much displacement. If you have a large distance between your window and your sample, this angle actually does contribute to the size of the spot. And so these things, the thin window and close spacing are some of the things you have to worry about when you're setting up a microbeam experiment. And of course, it isn't, energy loss isn't uh, totally useless. It's useful for beam diagnostics. Uh, this is a a detector which is called a solid state detector. It's generally made out of silicon or germanium and it's treated in such a way with a, a front surface that produces a diode here and when you put a voltage on it you end up with no charge carriers in this region. And when a, an ion comes in and goes in here, the, because it loses energy it creates ion pairs, electron ion pairs in the silicon and those are collected uh, and taken off to an amplifier and, and for analysis. But the interesting thing is that the number of ions released is directly proportional to how much energy that particle had coming in. In fact, in, in this kind of detector, it takes 3.6 eV to produce one electron hole pair. And so when you take the output signal of this, what you have is the energy of the particle that came in. Okay, microbeam systems. There's a lot of stuff you have to put together to make a microbeam work. And this is a, a list of them. You need a source of charged particles. Uh, generally it's a, an accelerator, usually a, a Van de Graaff type or the more, more modern uh, uh, singletron or, uh, or it could be a pelotron. There are various ways that you can get charged particles. It can be a single-ended machine, it can be a, a tandem. Uh, there are cyclotrons that are used as microbeam charged particle sources, but uh, first you need your accelerator. There are actually people who do it, trying to do it with a, uh, a small alpha particle source inside a capillary. So your source, if you don't want a very high resolution system, you might work with a, a, uh, a, uh, an alpha particle source. And of course there are people who use electrons for their microbeams as a charged particle need a beam transport system, that is to get them from your accelerator to your target. You need a focusing or a collimating system. You need a vacuum exit window. You need some way of identifying the targets that you want to shoot at. So you have to have microscope and, uh, and video system and computer control with that. Means to aim the beam at the target, and that means either here's the beam and you move the target this way, or the target is here, and you move the beam. But you need uh, some means of uh, getting the, the aimed at the target. So that's a, an interesting component. It's usually speed and accuracy are what you're looking at here. 
you need some way to detect the fact that a particle has come through. Uh, usually counted, uh, and you need a way to turn it off when enough of them have gone by. It's also possible to do experiments if you're doing more than, say more than 20 particles, and you have a stable source of charged particles, so you have a steady count rate. Uh, you can open the shutter for a fixed amount of time and you get a, a Poisson distribution of the average number of particles for that time. So if you have 100, it'll be 100 plus or minus 10. So somewhere between 90 and 110 will be the, your main peak if you can't count your particles during the irradiation. And for, for uh, many proton experiments, you're going to be using 100 particles or more per exposure, so a, a counted system uh, will work. Um, these things aren't immediately in what you need to make a microbeam, but you need uh, fixtures and things for ha holding your samples. Can't do experiments without that. And uh, it really gets interesting when you actually have online analysis systems. So this is a, an addition to the uh, making a microbeam itself, but uh, it makes it much more useful if you have integrated analysis uh, capability on either a, a epifluorescence microscopy that goes with certain reporters. Uh, there could be chemical interactions of microfluidics uh, feed through the stuff that Guy talks about or we'll talk about some more. Uh, so these things are what makes it, makes it more interesting than just a basic microbeam. So we have a bunch of cells growing on a dish. We have an accelerator, source of charged particles. We have a beam that comes through and irradiates a cell. We have a detector that goes off to the computer. And from the counting here, it operates a shutter. Close it off. OK, we also have a, instead of that first system, showed with a collimated beam, which was a fairly large area. You can't make a, a collimated system much better than maybe two microns is the best you can do it, because you start getting so much scattering from the edge of, the, of your collimator. So if you're going to have less than a, about two microns, you'll probably need a focusing system of some kind, and then it goes through a small fraction of the cell. And uh, we have our microscope and imaging system also going off to the computer and that goes back and controls the stage so it allows us to move from one target to the other. Okay, a little bit of ninth grade science for you. Atoms, ions, related to the ion source. F forces on ions with uh, uh, electric forces that we use in the accelerator, magnetic forces for uh, moving them in the tr beam transport focusing systems and interaction of uh, ions with matter we talked about. It's not, as I say, it's not ninth grade science and a little bit of the vacuum system in the window. So back to our helium ion. It's a plus two charge. The ion source in our accelerator looks like this. It's a uh, quartz tube. It has a little exit aperture here. It has a means of introducing the gas. Uh, there clips on here to put in RF power to ionize it. There's a probe here which pushes the ions out the bottom. And not shown, there's a, another electrode here that focuses them and, and connects them onto the accelerator, matches them into the accelerator. And this is what it looks like when it's in operation. Actually, that's while well, it's being repaired. Uh, normally, the accelerator is, in case, is enclosed in a, in a pressure chamber. But that's what the ion source looks like when it's uh, making alpha particles. So again, uh, electric fields around opposite charges, uh, around same charges here, they repel each other. And so if you put, uh, that's the ion coming through a small aperture in a plate, and we put positive charge on this, which repels that ion, put negative charges here, and so the ions accelerate through whatever this voltage drop is. If you have a 50 kilovolts across this, 
and this ion comes in with zero energy here, it comes out with an energy of 50 keV on the other side. And so this is a very simple schematic of one section of an accelerator, but you put together, how many is this, 106 of them no, here? No, it's 66. Oh, it's 66. On the old, so there's 66 uh, banks here of those plates, plus and minus, stacked on top of each other. So at the top of this column, you have five million volts, and at the bottom you have zero, and then your ion comes out the bottom if it's charge one with five MeV. So five megavolts on the terminal gives you five MeV energy of a single charged ion. Helium char charge two, it would come out at 10 MeV, mega electron volts. So it, a charge two falling through five million volts of potential drop gets 10 million volts of uh, energy when it comes out the bottom. You can see here the, the bottom of the pressure tank, one of the things if you try to put 5 million volts on a terminal out in the middle of the room, what you'll get is some huge sparks, lightning. Uh, if you run this in air, you can get about 100, maybe 150 kV in the middle of the winter when it's dry before it starts to spark. But there's a pressure tank that goes on it's filled with sulfur hexafluoride, which is a very good insulating gas. And then you can run this to five and a half million volts. Uh, you have to be careful when you get near the top, it starts to spark until the conditions. But uh, so that's uh, the tank closed up. And uh, there's a control computer and electronics to make the thing work. Thing run the ion source, run the control of the, the voltage on it. See the beginning of the beam line here, and uh, so we. How do you deliver this to the target? Uh, we have electric fields that we can change the direction. We can have magnetic fields that apply a force to it to change the direction, and uh, the magnetic force is, it turns out is at right angles to both the direction of the travel of the particle and to the uh, direction of the field lines. So you have a magnetic field here. This is a, a magnet which you either saw yesterday or will see later today, which has a magnetic field which is uh, actually is drawn here as going in this direction, coming out. So the particle goes in, the field is this way, and the force is upward. So particle direction, field direction, force on the right hand. And so the particles now are bent upward. You can also use this in a quadrupole lens. So here is a, a lens which has a north and south poles. The field lines are this direction. Actually, this is, I should point to this one because this is the magnetic. The, the field lines go this way and this way. And what that does is provides a force which in this region is outward and in this region is inward. So what you have is the it's focusing the beam in one direction and defocusing it in the other direction. Uh, you'd say, why is this of any use? But it turns out that the f strength of the focusing is greater than the strength of the defocusing. So if you use two of these, the next one rotated 90 degrees, you can focus in both directions. Now, with electric fields, it does the same thing, except here the the forces are toward the pole. It's a, if it's a positive ion, it's away, away from the positive pole and toward the negative pole. But again, the same thing, focusing in one plane and defocusing in the other. And the uh, reminder that the compression is stronger than the expansion. So if you use two of these shifted by 90 degrees, you can get overall focusing. This is the lens we're using in our uh, system. We actually use two lenses of this sort. It's an electrostatic quadrupole, it's a triplet, and it's arranged so this one focuses, say, in the x direction, this one focuses in the y direction, and this one focuses again in the x direction. And so then you end up with a overall focusing uh, at the outside, and this is a a simulation with a ray tracing program called GIOS. This one's not free, not horribly expensive, but it's a, a good design program. So the, here, are the, this first lens is defocus, focus, defocus in this plane. And here the order is reversed. So here it's 
defocusing there, the first one here is focusing. So focus, defocus, focus to a point. And then the 90 degrees out of that, see this one's focusing in, the, in this plane. And the, here again, it's defocus, focus, you know, matching. The interesting thing about this setup is it gives you an equal demagnification. That is, if you start with a certain spot size here, in, in both dimensions, you end up with the same size spot in bo both directions. But it also has a characteristic that the amount that the, the particles or the angle that they come in is the same in both of these. So it's a, a nice symmetric system. The uh, design was done so that the lengths of the poles were adjusted so that you had approximately the same voltage on all electrodes. And that is the reason for that is that if we, if we look at this, the weak point here is that it would tend to break down across this electrode. And if we had it arranged with equal length in a triplet, it would turn out that the central portion would have to have about twice the voltage on it. So you might have 5 kV, 10 kV, and 5 kV. So this would be the one, always the one that failed. So instead of that, we give the double the strength by making it twice as long. Now this system, as we have it set up, operates, it takes about three kilovolts on this lens for every, every megavolt of terminal voltage. So if we're running three MeV on the machine, we need about nine kilovolts on this lens. And that's an interesting thing about an electrostatic system of this sort is that the focusing strength you need depends only on the accelerating potential in the, in the accelerator. So it, if, uh, and it, it doesn't matter what the ion is or what the charge on the ion is. So this will, if you go with a proton for instance, it go, has charge one, three million volts, gives you three megavolts. You take an alpha particle, charge two, it's six megavolts. It's got a different mass, it's got a different charge but it'll focus exactly the same way in this lens because this is, this is electrostatic and you can think of all electrostatic things sort of go together. If you have a system that's all that's steering and focusing is electric and your acceleration is electric, everything is proportional. So if you, if you double the accelerating potential, you double everything else, it'll work exactly the same way. It's useful in modeling that you sometimes find it more convenient to do the calculation at, at uh, at one energy or one, one charge, one, one, one velocity, but then you can know how it will behave for other systems at the, in the same way. It turns out in order to get a small, small spot size, these, these lens systems have what's referred to as aberrations. The same as the aberrations you have, well, aberrations I have in my eyeball are corrected by these. The, uh, but the, the amount of uh, degradation of the beam spot due to aberrations is always related to how big the diameter is of your, uh, your beam. So if you want to get a small beam spot, one of the ways to do it is to make the apertures all smaller. Uh, one, and another way to do it is to try to design lens systems with very small aberrations. So you do the first, you get the lens system with the aberrations as small as you can figure out how to make them. And then you make the, as you want to get better and better beam spots, you make your apertures smaller and smaller. And this is just a, a model. Uh, if you want a certain beam spot size, say one micron here, this curve connects points which have the same uh, acceptance of the system. That is, as they say, think count rate. That this is the best combination of the aperture which limits this, this, uh, there's an aperture at this point which limits the divergence of the system, the divergence of the beam, and then there's the size of the, uh, of the opening aperture, the object aperture here. So the, there's this aperture and this aperture. If you make this one smaller, you can make this one larger and then get, get back the same amount of beam current through it. So, and each of them affects the, the uh, size differently, but the, you can calculate the best combination of object aperture and angle limiting aperture 
to get the most beam through it. And that's what these curves join uh, lines of equal acceptance. And as you come down here, these are each a factor of two in acceptance that's in one dimension. So it's a factor of four in count rate for each of these steps. So if you have a one micron beam and you say you want a 300 nanometer size beam, you've got to go down 4, 8, 16. So you have 1 16th of the beam current here uh, to, if you're going just by decreasing aperture sizes. And you eventually reach a point where you don't have any beam. Uh, a very tiny spot but no beam in it. Um, one of the reasons I say that the target size here is 300 nanometers is that for an alpha particle beam of the energies we use, that's sort of the diameter of the track. You know, the, the uh, secondary ions going off from the, from the alpha particle track going through, this is sort of the physical diameter of the, of the damage volume. And it's also at approximately the limit that you get for ordinary microscope uh, optics for finding things. Uh, you're, you're limited. We, we are working on a way to get to, to cheat on the, the uh, limits of the microscopy, but, but that's sort of a, a size. Um, we're, of course, going to try to do better than that, but that's, that's where, we're, where the system I have now can probably go to this sort of dimension. 